Okay, so in the last class, uh, we started this topic on uh, ultrasonic uh, testing and then we learned about uh, the basic principle first and then we also saw the beam shape and the pulse shape. So, we saw first that uh, an ultrasonic pulse is generated for about uh, 1 microsecond. So, you use this kind of uh, short pulses to uh, make that ultrasonic beam which uh, goes into the sample and we have also seen that uh, these pulses are uh, a mix of uh, several frequencies which is little above or little below the actual frequency and when you take the resultant of all this frequency, uh, you get the uh, chosen frequency. Okay? And then you we, uh, we talked about uh, the beam shape and then we saw that it uh, primarily depends on uh, this ratio lambda by d where lambda is the wavelength of the sound waves and d is the diameter of the ultrasonic probe. Okay? So, as you keep increasing uh, the diameter with respect to the wavelength, uh, the beam becomes more and more directional and as we discussed that is because uh, what is known as diffraction effects coming out uh, due to uh, constructive interferences of the sound waves uh, which are coming out from different points of the same transducer. So, these are known as diffraction effects uh, due to constructive interference. And then uh, we saw that finally, when uh, d is much uh, larger than lambda, which is actually the case uh, in real scenarios when we use this uh, transducer to do NDT. So, then we saw that it takes off uh, a shape like this, which is uh, radiating out like a uh, such light ok. So, it uh, becomes directional like this. So, this is uh, the scenario for this ok. So, in this case uh, you can see that uh, the beam is uh, divergent. So, it has a divergence angle alpha. Okay. So, today we will talk uh, about this uh, little bit more and then we will we'll see what are the different characteristics uh, this kind of beam has and after that we will go on to see uh, the ultrasonic uh, system, the inspection system, uh, the transducers, different kinds of transducers and then if time permits we will also see in today's class uh, how the test is done. Okay. Okay, so, let us talk about this first. So, it has a divergence angle and if you uh, talk about uh, the intensities across this beam, uh, you will see that uh, there will be lot of uh, fluctuations uh, near to the transducer. Okay. So, this is the uh, probe or the transducer and this is how the beam is coming out of it. So, close to the uh, transducer there will be a lot of uh, fluctuations in the intensity and as it uh, goes away uh, from the transducer, then the beam kind of becomes more uniform, uh, these fluctuations will die down and the beam will take up a more uniform form. So, there are two regions based upon that depending on uh, whether you have fluctuations or not. 
So, in the region where you have lot of fluctuations uh, near the transducer that is called as near field and the region away from the transducer where the beam becomes more uniform that is called far field. This near field is also known as uh, Fresnel zone. And the other name for the far field is uh, Fraunhofer zone. Okay, so, these are the two different regions you have uh, in the beam and if you want to uh, see them and express them in, in terms of uh, some parameters on which the extent of each of these uh, fields will depend. So, the near field if we call that as n, uh, it will depend on uh, the size or the diameter of the uh, transducer in this fashion and it would also depend on the wavelength lambda. Okay. So, this is the uh, extent of uh, the near field which depends on the size of the transducer d and the wavelength lambda and if uh, nu be the frequency uh, this can be expressed in terms of uh, the frequency also. So, then this will become because we have seen before that uh, lambda is equal to V by the frequency if the frequency is called by nu. So, this is lambda in terms of uh, the velocity V and the frequency. So, if you replace that over here you get this near field in terms of the frequency of the sound waves and the velocity v. Okay. And if you see the far field, uh, far field is uh, characterized by this uh, divergence angle alpha. So, this alpha depends on again the same two parameters, but this time it is in a different uh, way. So, now in this case this is directly proportional to the wavelength unlike uh, the near field which was inversely proportional. So, this divergence angle alpha is given by uh, this particular uh, relationship. So, this is again dependent on the wavelength of the sound and uh, the dimension or the size of the probe. And of course, it would depend on the medium through which uh, the sound waves are traveling. So, let us say for steel, if you see these values at a particular frequency of let us say 1 megahertz. Okay. So, when you vary d, to this sizes 3 8 inch, half a inch and 1 inch. Okay. So, for this uh, 3 sizes, 3 different values of d, n would be <coughs> 0 0.15 point 27 and 1.1 1 .1 inches and the value of alpha would be uh, 48 degrees 10 minute then 34 degree and 16 degree 10 minute. Okay. So, this is how uh, for a particular material as you 
vary the size of the probe at a particular frequency this is how uh, the near field and the far field would change. Now, this uh, near field uh, fluctuations it has some implications on the ultrasonic uh, testing. Okay, so, due to this uh, high fluctuations even after the uh, sound beam is transmitted into the sample uh, this uh, portion this near field would still vibrate okay? and it will take some time for the vibrations to die down completely. And if you are using a uh, transmission receiving system that means the same transducer is acting as both uh, as a transmitter and as a receiver also. So, in that case a uh, transmitter or, or a probe cannot receive until the transmission is completely stopped. Okay? So, in this case in the near field if it is still vibrating that means it is still transmitting. So, if any echo comes back within that time when it is still vibrating then it would not be able to receive that echo. Okay? And that can happen if that echo comes back very fast, if it comes back quickly. That means, if uh, something is very close to the surface of the sample, that is if something a, a defect or a reflecting interface is very close to the probe, then there is a chance that uh, that particular defect will be missed because the echo coming out from that defect will not be received by the transducer because uh, it will still be vibrating since uh, the echo is coming back very fast. Okay? So, that particular distance is known as dead zone. So, this is a distance into the sample. which cannot be inspected due to the near field fluctuations. Okay? So, this is the uh, direct effect of the near field fluctuations because as I said a probe cannot uh, receive when it is still transmitting. And due to that fact, the near surface uh, defects or near surface echoes may be missed. So, that particular distance which cannot be inspected due to this fluctuations as I said is known as the dead zone. Okay? But there are some ways, uh, some means and ways by which uh, this dead zone can be avoided or at least can be minimized. So, this problem of uh, dead zone can be addressed by using a shorter pulse. or high frequency. Then uh, you can use uh, something called a delay probe or a delay version of probe. So, uh, in this kind of uh, delay probes uh, there is a uh, delay layer which is made of a different material like uh, for example, a polymeric material. In uh, which uh, the velocity of sound is lower.
Okay. So, since the velocity in this layer is lower, it will delay uh, the sound wave when it comes back uh, to the probe. Okay. So, then uh, the uh, probe will have enough time uh, for these fluctuations to die down completely and by the time uh, the echo comes back to the probe, it will be ready for receiving. Okay. So, due to that delay uh, which is provided by this delay layer, the probe will be ready for receiving by the time the um, echo comes back even if uh, it is from a near surface discontinuity. Okay. And then uh, the other way of uh, avoiding uh, dead zone is to use uh, what is uh, called a dual element probe. So, in this case as the name suggests it has two elements, two uh, active elements uh, which uh, generates these ultrasonic uh, pulses. So, these are actually piezoelectric elements which we will talk about little later in more detail. So, uh, in rest of the cases what we discussed before uh, when you say that uh, the same probe is used for both transmission and uh, receiving. In those cases uh, it is only one element, but in this case in case of uh, dual element probes there are uh, two elements. One is uh, used as transmitter and the other is used as a receiver. Okay. So, in this case uh, since the same element is not uh, transmitting and receiving you do not have the problem that you have in a single element transducer. So, one probe uh, will transmit uh, the ultrasonic pulses into the sample and the other one will receive. So, there will be no problem in receiving it because the fluctuations are not in picture in this case because a different element is receiving the echo which is coming out from the sample. Okay. So, this is another way of addressing the dead zone effect and there is one more uh, way, there is one more method by which uh, you can address uh, dead zone that is by immersion testing. Okay. So, in this case uh, the sample or the probe is immersed in a liquid like water and it is well known that uh, the velocity of sound in water is much lower compared to that in metals. Okay. So, if you have a metallic sample uh, which is the case most of the time, then uh, you can immerse the sample inside water. So, when the echoes uh, come out from the sample they have to travel through this water path and since the velocity of sound in water is much lower, it will delay the sound waves uh, coming out from the sample. By the time uh, they reach the probe which is at the top surface of the water or, or the liquid. By that time it will have enough time due to this delay uh, for all the fluctuations to come down or die down completely and the transducer will be ready to receive. So, this water path again is introduced uh, to uh, delay this. So, this is again uh, serving the same purpose like what the delay layer does uh, in the delay version of the probe. So, here also due to that delay the probe will be having enough time for all the fluctuations to die down and by the time any echo comes back to it, it will be ready to receive. Okay. So, these are different ways uh, by which uh, the dead zone uh, effect can be addressed. 
So, now let us talk about uh, the ultrasonic probes and let us see what kind of uh, probes we have, uh, what are the different uh, constituents or elements inside a probe and what are the different types of probes and then we will finally see how these probes are used and uh, how do you get the defect signal by uh, doing uh, ultrasonic testing. So, in an uh, ultrasonic transducer a uh, single spike of uh, electrical signal of uh, short uh, rise time. is converted to high frequency mechanical vibration. So, this is the device uh, which uh, converts an electrical signal into mechanical vibrations and that is as you may all know is called piezoelectricity. Right? So, the main uh, element or the main component of an ultrasonic transducer is a piezoelectric element which uh, converts uh, an electrical signal into uh, mechanical vibration or uh, ultrasonic waves. Okay? So, that means all you have uh, is a small uh, piezoelectric element. which uh, vibrates at a particular frequency when you uh, supply an electrical signal and the vibration frequency would depend on uh, the thickness of the element. Okay, so, it vibrates with a wavelength which is twice the thickness. Twice the thickness of the element. Okay. So, that means, uh, for higher frequency the thickness has to be lower. Okay. So, lower the thickness uh, higher will be the frequency. So, that means, the elements have to be uh, cut out into uh, thin wafers, because we are uh, talking about uh, frequencies in the range of uh, 20 kilohertz to uh, 5 megahertz or 10 megahertz. So, these are very high frequency vibrations and that is why the element has to be very thin. Okay. And it has to be constructed in a proper housing, in a proper uh, encasing, uh, wherein you can provide the electrical uh, leads to supply that electrical signal. Okay. So, let us see how is the construction uh, for these ultrasonic uh, transducers. But before that, uh, let us talk about uh, what is the material of uh, this piezoelectric element and uh, what are those parameters uh, which uh, control uh, the transmitting and the receiving ability of this uh, element or the transducer. So, the most uh, commonly known uh, piezoelectric material as you might all know is quartz. So, single crystal uh, quartz uh, can be used for making these elements for ultrasonic uh, probes. 
there is uh, uh, one more uh, material uh, which shows uh, very good uh, piezoelectric property and that is known as PZT which stands for lead that is PB. So, that is where the P comes from zirconet that is the Z titanate that is the T. Okay. So, this lead uh, zirconate titanate polycrystalline lead zirconate titanate is again a very good uh, piezoelectric uh, material shows very good uh, piezoelectric uh, property and this can be used in the ultrasonic probes. Okay, so, let us see uh, in terms of their properties what is the level of uh, these parameters uh, which control this uh, vibrations or these ultrasonic uh, waves in terms of uh, transmitting and receiving for these two particular materials. Okay. So, when you uh, talk about uh, the parameters which uh, control the uh, transmission and uh, receiving properties, then you have to see how uh, these waves are generated by the elements. So, uh, piezoelectric or piezoelectricity as you all know when you uh, supply an electrical signal you get uh, vibrations. On the other hand if you have mechanical strain that can also be converted to an electrical signal. Okay. So, let us say an electric uh, field F uh, is uh, supplied. So, with uh, respect to this uh, electric field uh, mechanical stresses will be generated and uh, if the mechanical stress is a sigma then it will be proportional to the electric field being applied. Okay. Similarly, if you have a mechanical vibration or a mechanical strain that will also generate an electrical signal. So, if uh, epsilon be the mechanical strain then it will generate uh, this electrical signal f. So, this two again will be proportional. So, the main uh, component uh, as we just now saw of uh, the ultrasonic transducer uh, is a thin wafer of uh, a piezoelectric element uh, which uh, when excited by an electrical signal will generate the ultrasonic vibrations. Okay. And then uh, this element has to be housed properly inside uh, some kind of encasing where we can provide all the electrical leads and other things to uh, supply the uh, electrical signal first of all. And then uh, you have to also uh, shield it uh, from other uh, mechanical vibrations, so that uh, there is enough damping at the background of this uh, element. So, all those uh, uh, construction aspects uh, for an ultrasonic transducer uh, we will discuss in little more detail, but today uh, I will not have time to uh, discuss that. So, for today this is all I have. So, I will stop here today. In the next class, we are going to discuss uh, more about uh, the ultrasonic transducers, what is the construction of a transducer and you know what are the parameters which uh, control this and then we will see how uh, a transducer is used to uh, do ultrasonic testing. Okay. So, I will stop here today, I will see you next time. Thank you.